Hey there, you know I love a challenge, and this deep dive you've requested into sustainable construction in the UK, well, let's just say it's a big one. We're talking reports, articles, the whole shebang. It's certainly a hot topic right now. It is, and you're clearly ready to dig in and figure out how this industry plans to get to net zero by 2050. But going through all this, I think we found a bit of blind spot. It's an area that definitely needs more attention. Your sources highlight a really interesting aspect of the UK's strategy when it comes to construction and net zero. Okay, so we all know construction has a huge GE impact on climate change. Huge is an understatement. Right. A whopping 25% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions come from construction. Who knew? It's a staggering statistic when you think about it. It really is. And here's the thing. Everyone seems to be focused on how much energy a building uses once it's already built. You know, the heating, all the appliances. But what about like the cost of actually making the building materials in the first place? You've hit on a crucial point. Your sources bring up this term, embodied carbon. Embodied carbon. Yeah, so it basically means all the carbon emissions from the entire life of a building material. So that's from when it's made, to transporting it, the installation, all the way to demolition. Think about it. You could build the most energy efficient building possible, but if the materials themselves have a huge carbon footprint, you're missing a big part of the problem. It's like eating salads all week, but then having a burger binge on the weekend that totally cancels it out. Exactly. And we're talking about some serious numbers here. Think 40 to 50 million tons of CO2 per year just in the UK from embodied carbon. Wait, 40 to 50 million tons? That's insane. That's what, more than all the planes and ships combined? It's a significant amount, that's for sure. And what's even more surprising is that there isn't a standard way of even measuring this embodied carbon in the UK. So how are we supposed to fix something we can't even measure properly? That's the million dollar question and a huge challenge highlighted by several of your sources. Without a consistent way to measure it, how can we compare different materials or different building methods? It's like everyone's using a different recipe, but with different units of measurement. A recipe for disaster. Exactly. So how are other countries dealing with this? The UK can't be the only one with this problem. Well, actually, other countries are ahead of the game on this. The Netherlands, for example. They've had mandatory whole life carbon calculations, and that includes embodied carbon for larger residential and office buildings since way back in 2013. 2013, okay, so they're way ahead. And France, they're phasing in similar regulations as part of their RE 2020 plan, aiming for carbon neutrality in buildings by 2050. They're setting limits on embodied carbon emissions for new buildings and giving incentives for using low carbon materials. Materials. Wow, they're not messing around. It sounds like the UK has some catching up to do. But before we get into all that, let's talk about the materials themselves. I mean, if we're trying to reduce embodied carbon, we need to know what the worst offenders are. Right? Absolutely. And I bet you can already guess some of the main culprits. Let me guess concrete. Concrete is a big one. And steel. Definitely. They're both essential for construction because they're strong and durable, but... But they come with a hefty carbon footprint. Exactly. Concrete production alone is responsible for a shocking 8% of global CO2 emissions. 8%. Okay, no wonder everyone's looking for greener options. So, what about timber? It seems like everyone's talking about timber these days as a sustainable alternative. Timber is interesting. It has a lot of potentials, and your sources go into quite a bit of detail about this. On the surface, it seems perfect. It's renewable, and it actually stores carbon acting like a carbon sink. Sounds like a dream come true. It does, but the UK has some unique challenges when it comes to actually using timber on a larger scale. Like, is it, is it just not as readily available here? That's definitely part of it. The UK does have a timber industry, of course, but it's not as developed or as integrated into construction as it is in other parts of Europe. Like Scandinavia. I've heard their timber construction is amazing. Exactly. One of your articles quotes Sam Liptrot, a sustainability expert, who points out that the UK just doesn't have the same level of experience with timber construction that you see in places like Sweden or Finland. They build entire buildings out of timber there. So it's not just about having the trees, it's about knowing how to use them effectively. It's a whole different way of thinking about building. Plus, there's still this perception that timber isn't as safe, especially when it comes to fire. Right. The Grenfell Tower tragedy definitely made everyone think twice about using anything flammable in buildings, yeah. especially high rises. But I've also read that timber can be quite fire resistant if it's used correctly. You're right. It can be. Modern timber construction techniques, particularly those using large prefabricated panels, 
can offer significant fire resistance. So how do we overcome that fear factor? It requires a multi-pronged approach. Clear communication about those advancements, rigorous testing standards, and importantly, building codes and regulations that reflect the reality of modern timber construction. We need to base our policies on evidence, not fear. It sounds like there's a bit of a balancing act. We need to address legitimate safety concerns, but also be open to exploring more sustainable building solutions. Hmm. Speaking of which, what is the government doing to encourage and support sustainable construction practices, especially when it comes to this embodied carbon thing? Well, on paper, the UK government has made some pretty big promises. Oh, here we go. The classic, we have a plan, but no real action scenario. Well, it's not quite that simple. There are initiatives in place, like the industrial decarbonization strategy, which is supposed to use public procurement to boost demand for low carbon materials. And then there's the National Procurement Policy Statement, which encourages government agencies to think about the environment when they're deciding what to buy. But... There's always a but. What's the catch? These initiatives often lack any real teeth. They're big on ambition, but short on concrete action. So more like guidelines than actual rules. Exactly. The government says it wants to use low-carbon materials in public projects, but are they actually measuring the embodied carbon of those materials? And are those measurements actually changing what they decide to buy? It's not always clear. So it's like dipping a toe in the water, but not being ready to take the full plunge just yet. It's more like they're testing the waters, but not quite ready to dive in headfirst. And it's not just procurement where we see this hesitancy. Oh, what else is giving them cold feet? Let's talk about retrofitting existing buildings versus building brand new ones. You'd think with all this focus on embodied carbon, reusing and adapting what we already have would be a no-brainer. Right. It just makes sense. Why demolish a perfectly good building when you could give it a makeover and save all that waste and embodied carbon from making new materials? So what's the holdup? Well, there's this thing called permitted development rights that the UK government expanded back in 2020. Permitted development rights. Sounds like a mouthful. It's a bit of planning jargon, I know. Essentially, it's meant to streamline the planning process for certain types of construction projects, like a fast track option. Okay, so how does that tie into this whole retrofitting versus new build dilemma? Well, these expanded rights made it much easier to demolish vacant properties and build new residential buildings in their place. And they could do it without going through the full planning process. So they wanted to speed up housing development but ended up encouraging demolition over retrofitting. Precisely. It's like offering tax breaks for buying a brand new gas guzzler, but not for making your old car more fuel efficient. That's quite the mixed message. It is. And it highlights the need for more joined up thinking when it comes to policymaking. We need to ensure that our planning regulations incentivize the outcomes we want to see in this case, more reuse and less demolition. So even though the government is talking talk about retrofitting, their actions are telling a different story. It's like promoting healthy eating while handing out coupons for fast food. A very apt analogy. And to make matters even more complicated, we also need to consider how VAT, the value added tax, is applied to building materials. Uh oh, VAT. This is where my eyes usually glaze over. But go on, walk me through it. For a long time, there was a big difference in the VAT rate on energy saving materials, depending on whether they were used in new builds or retrofits. New builds got a much lower VAT, which made retrofitting seem way less appealing financially. So you're penalized for trying to do the right thing. That doesn't seem fair. No, it doesn't. And the government did recognize the issue. In 2022, they announced a change to the V8 regime to address this imbalance. Oh, so they fixed it. That's good news. Well, it's a step in the right direction, but the change is temporary and quite limited in scope. So while it's a positive sign, it's not a permanent solution just yet. It's like they're putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg. It helps a little, but it's not addressing the root of the problem. Exactly. And this actually leads to another aspect of permitted development rights that's relevant to our discussion. Conversions. Conversions. You mean like turning those old office blocks into trendy apartments? Exactly. Permitted development rights have made it easier to do those kinds of conversions without having to go through the full planning approval process. Which makes sense in theory. Reusing existing buildings, less demolition waste, more housing. It sounds like a win-win for sustainability. What's the catch? The issue is that without the proper oversight of a full planning application, some developers are cutting corners. Cutting corners, how? Think shoddy work, 
cramped living spaces, and a lack of basic amenities. It's led to a surge in these poorly designed and often substandard housing units. So they're trying to solve the housing shortage, but creating a whole new set of problems in the process. And it undermines the whole idea of sustainable construction if those new apartments aren't built to last or to be energy efficient. It's a classic example of short-term thinking with potentially long-term consequences. We need to ensure that any development, whether it's a new build or a conversion, meets high standards of sustainability, affordability, and quality of life for residents. Well said. But let's shift gears a bit and talk about the people who actually make all of this happen, the construction workforce. Even with the best intentions, the greenest materials, and the most ambitious policies, we still need skilled workers to put it all into practice, right? Absolutely. And that's another big challenge the UK faces, a chronic shortage of skilled workers, especially in areas like energy efficient construction and retrofitting. Mm. We could have all the innovative designs and sustainable materials in the world, but if we don't have enough skilled people to install them, it's all for nothing. So what's causing this skills gap? Is it just a case of not enough young people going into the trades? It's a complex issue with many contributing factors. Attracting young talent is definitely crucial, but it's not just about bringing in new people. We also need to focus on upskilling the existing workforce, many of whom were trained in traditional construction methods that may not be as aligned with the latest sustainable practices. It's like trying to teach your grandparents to use TikTok. They might be willing to learn, but it's a whole new world. And I imagine that lack of standardization we talked about earlier isn't helping, is it? It's a huge barrier. Without a consistent way of measuring and implementing sustainable construction, it's incredibly difficult to create effective training programs. It's like trying to teach someone to cook without any standard units of measurement chaos. So how do we fix it? Some organizations are pushing for a more modular approach to training, where workers can pick and choose specific skills based on what they need for their jobs. This would allow for more flexibility, but it requires significant investment in developing those specialized training modules. So we need a more adaptable training system that can evolve alongside the constantly changing world of sustainable construction. Precisely. But it's not just about technical skills, is it? We need to make sure that everyone in the industry, from architects to construction workers, understands why sustainable practices are important. It's about shifting the mindset from simply following regulations to understanding the broader impact of our work. It's about fostering a sense of shared responsibility for creating a more sustainable future. Exactly. And that's where clear signals from the government are so crucial. By setting high standards, providing incentives, and creating a supportive regulatory environment, the government can play a huge role in driving the industry towards a more sustainable future. So it's not just about telling people what to do. It's about creating an environment where sustainable construction is seen as the best and most viable option. Precisely. We need to move beyond simply talking about sustainability and start putting those words into concrete action. Speaking of concrete action, I think there's one crucial piece of the puzzle we haven't talked about yet. Even if we get the government and the industry on board, what about the people who will actually be living and working in these buildings? Mm. It all comes down to what people actually want, right? If people aren't specifically looking for sustainable homes, are developers really going to go out of their way to build them? It's a bit of a chicken or egg situation. Developers often say they're just bathing what people want to buy, what the market demands. But consumer awareness can be a really powerful driver for change. So if enough people make sustainability a priority, the market will have to respond. Exactly. If people are demanding sustainable homes, developers will have no choice but to build them. Okay, so how do we get there? How do we make sustainable construction the norm, not just a niche market? Education is key. We need to make sure people understand the impact of their choices. And that includes where they choose to live and work. We need to help people see that the decisions made during the design and construction of a building have a ripple effect. It's about understanding those connections between our individual choices and their larger impact. Exactly. And it's not just about making these big, life-altering decisions. So you're saying it's not just about, say, choosing to live in a super eco-friendly passive house. Right. Those are great, but even small changes can make a difference. Like what? What are some things people can do in their own homes, even if they're not building a new one from scratch? Think about energy efficiency, better insulation, energy efficient appliances, LED lighting, things like that. Those can all make a big difference in a building's overall environmental impact. And a lot of those changes can even save people money on their energy bills in the long run. Absolutely, it's a win-win. And if you are doing renovations, 
Think about the materials you're using. Are there recycled options? Can you get materials locally? Every little bit helps. It's about shifting our mindset from a throwaway culture to one that values durability and minimizing waste. Exactly. And I think there's a huge opportunity here, not just to transform the construction industry, but to create a more sustainable built environment for everyone. Imagine cities designed for walkability, buildings that generate more energy than they use, communities designed with sustainability in mind. It's a vision of a future where sustainability is just the default setting, but it takes work to get there. It does. It requires a shifting perspective, a willingness to embrace new ideas and challenge the status quo. Mm -hmm. It requires collaboration and innovation from everyone involved, policymakers, industry leaders, and individuals alike. So it's not just up to the government or big corporations to solve this. We all have a part to play. Absolutely. We need to demand better from our leaders, from our industries, and from ourselves. We need to ask those tough questions and hold each other accountable. Because ultimately, we all share this planet, and we all have a stake in its future. Well, that was a fascinating deep dive. Thank you for joining me today. And a huge thank you to our listeners for sending in this request. It's clear that sustainable construction is a topic that's on a lot of people's minds, and for good reason. The choices we make today will have a lasting impact on the world we build for tomorrow. Until next time, keep learning, keep asking questions, and keep pushing for a more sustainable future. That's all for this deep dive. We'll see you next time.